White Tail TV. Kansas is it for big white tails. <laughs> Kansas has been a storybook state for whitetail hunters for years. I mean, I remember back in the days, it used to be really hard for a non-resident to get a tag to hunt deer in Kansas because everybody learned this is something special. I've been to Kansas several times and I'm going back this year. I just drew a tag, uh, a muzzleloading tag, and I am really pumped about it. Hunting Kansas whitetails isn't really that much different than hunting other Midwestern areas. You'll find some good public hunting in Kansas. There's scattered areas throughout, and those big bucks, they don't always know the boundaries from private to public. So don't forget about the public opportunities in the land of Oz. How do you pattern a buck on public ground? The way I do it is completely different than most. I'm not trying to pattern that buck on public land, I'm trying to pattern other hunters. How did that mature buck get to be mature living in the war zone? He got to be mature by avoiding us. There's so much land. There's a lot of farmland, still active farmland, ranching land. There's plenty of area, lots of topography for deer to hide. And that's what Mark knows. Mark is excited to hunt Kansas because he knows it's got the potential. He's shot the deer there. So Mark's in heaven right now. He's in Kansas bull hunting with his Matthews. Now this year was going to be special. Greg and Kenny had told me they were on a monster buck. So big, it was top secret. They weren't even hardly going to share the photos with me. But of course they did. They couldn't hold out. When I saw that buck, it was like, whoa, a true trophy. It's simply, Supply and demand. There's a lot of supply, not a ton of demand. There's not a lot of hunting pressure in Kansas, and that's why these deer get so big. The land of Oz may be a mecca for whitetail hunters, but it's not without its challenges. What they do is they find these areas that we don't go. Maybe it's that nasty, nasty ditch that nobody wants to cross. Maybe in one place where I drug a tremendous buck out of it had everything to do with having to scale ridges like this to get back there. Total will tell you that there's a lot of wind in Kansas. Chances are, if you're there to hunt three, four, five days, you're gonna see wind the majority of that time. What I look for is areas where, it, where maybe I can get out of the wind a little bit, because I know that's what the deer are doing too. They don't like the wind either. They're gonna do whatever they can to get out of the wind because it compromises their senses. So they're gonna to try to get into some more sheltered areas and that's what you need to do as well. You need to try to get out of the wind, at least to some degree. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Cuddyback Digital. More deer, fewer blanks. By Sig Sauer Electro Optics. Never settle by Thompson Center, America's master gun maker. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Plus technology. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. If you haven't heard about Kansas as far as being one of America's greatest whitetail hotspots, well, you've probably been living on another planet. <laughs> Kansas is it for big white tails. It has the habitat, it has the terrain. Of course, Kansas also has great genetics. There's always a chance for a, a booner to come out. That's the best thing about Kansas, you know, our density is not as high as some states, but there's always a chance a giant can come out. Unlike some other states, maybe the next door neighbor there, uh, Iowa, Kansas is actually relatively easy to get a hunting license, at least for whitetails. Those mule deer, well, that's another story for another TV show. But whitetails, you're going to get a tag. And you can get a tag for your archery hunt, your rifle hunt, or your muzzleloader hunt. But it's not the only reason I go to Kansas. Uh, I've got some good friends in Kansas. I like to go see my buddies Greg and Kenny. And I especially love to go hang out and look at their super whitetail properties. You know, I spend a lot of hours every year putting food plots in and set my stand locations up. And I've spread out to now, I have several locations and I think that really helped because you're always hunting different deer. And so if you, you know, one week, there may be the deer you're looking for, maybe running the doe in one area and you can, you can concentrate on that. A few days later, you might be on a different farm. You know, it all kind of goes in cycles. And, you know, just having those options really ups your chances. It's 
the Flint Hills. Rough, rugged, and coolies every few hundred yards. And these are cedar choke, oak choke, brush choked coolies. Whitetails can escape there easily. We're in a great stand site, a transition area between food plots, feed areas, and great bedding cover. Midday, it's a time to eat sandwiches, no doubt. But after you're done with that sandwich break, get back in the stand or stay in the stand. Now, where do you hunt at midday? If you can do it without spooking deer, try to hunt a little bit more interior. Think inside the woods. You could also find what I call interior edges. And we're in one of those spots right now. I've got good bedding cover on either side of me They've got bedding cover below me, but there's a little bit of an opening inside all of this cover. That's where the deer will go. They'll get up, they'll be restless during the rut, and it is the rut, and they will walk those interior edges. And if you're sitting there midday after that sandwich, you might just get lucky. And it was disappointing. Where were all those does that should have been streaming back out with bucks in tow? I think I might have seen one or two does that entire night. I headed back to camp thinking of a new strategy for the morning. Well, that's exactly what we wanted. Rutting, running action. That buck was chasing a doe. The doe come by so quick you could hardly even see her as a flash the buck was on her tail. That means some of these does are beginning to come into estrus. She's not ready to be bred yet, but that will help our success a lot. If we can see some more of that running, that's what we're hoping for, and that's what you're hoping for too on your run hunt. When it's good, when they're running they're, and they're trying to find does, it can just, you know, it can be nonstop action. You just gotta be ready. That evening, we headed up to a new property. Man, these guys got properties all over. It is so great to always be looking at fresh country. The food plot on this one, huh, off the charts. Green thumbs all the way around. So, I went back into decoy mode. I put a buck decoy out with a doe decoy, making it look like this buck had cornered a hot doe. Nothing showed up. No does, no bucks. Where were the deer? And why did a rutting buck not cruise through there? Thinking back to my first morning in Kansas, I just had to go back to that same spot. There were too many does in there. A young buck cruised through. Not a shooter, but a nice buck. After that buck disappeared, I sat back for another half hour, watched, looked around, and I decided I'm just gonna give it one more hard rattle session. And here, charging out of the corner, like a mad Brahma bull, was a big whitetail buck. It come just right up through the trees. I got ready. The buck was coming in 22 yards, and I couldn't shoot. Every time he went through a so-called shooting lane, it was blocked by too many branches. And then, right at the end, he turned, quartering away. I thought I was going to have the shot. I just couldn't get twisted enough in the tree stand. I could not get the shot. Pretty excited though, things were happening, and I got ready for the evening hunt. This segment of Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Matthews. Mark Kaiser is in Kansas, which is a magical place for whitetail hunters. But it's not all magic for Mark, who just had his heart broken by a mature buck who came into the call, but refused to give him a shot. 
it's time to regroup. In my mind, that big buck left and went to a bedding area on the back side of a food plot. On top of that food plot, there was a ground blind. Seemed like a good plan to me. Go up, get in the ground blind, and wait for that same buck I rattled in in the morning to show up. Out on the food plot, we've got a buck decoy and a bedded doe decoy. So we're gonna try to lure other deer from around, maybe rattle, maybe grunt, maybe just have them visualize, see if they'll come out to the food plot and give us a shot. Shooting light was about over when a buck did appear. He wasn't a shooter, he was just a nice up and comer, but he just got a little too nervous and wouldn't come in and commit totally decoy. I still had a good night. I got back to camp that night a little bit earlier than Greg. He had went to another property. When he came in, his face was pretty depressed. Greg said, I, I just had the encounter of a lifetime. I said, what, what, give me the details. I just saw a true giant white tail. And then he showed me his arrow on the very tip of the broadhead. It was just a skosh. You know what a skosh is, that's how your grandma cooks, just a skosh of this and a skosh of that, of white tail hair, maybe just a little bit of fat, but for the most part, not much of anything. I was pretty depressed, you know, the biggest deer I'd ever slung an arrow at. Still a little depressed, I didn't go out yesterday morning, but I managed to get out yesterday afternoon, sat there and right at, right at last light, he comes running the doe right in, 25 yards. Hit him good, he went about 75 yards, and. I got this, 193 inches gross, biggest deer by far that I've ever shot. You know, I've spent a lot of time and, and money on trail cameras and I've got them up and just seems like everywhere possible a deer could show up. But this deer somehow avoided me on all my cameras. He was pretty cagey. I think there's a lot more deer that avoid these cameras than people think. back to that same area where there were so many does. Does equal bucks. Once the breeding portion of the rut starts, and that's what's occurring right now, right here in Kansas, it can become a little hard to pattern these white tails. Things just get a little bit more random. The rut just tears up regular white tail patterns. They're not hitting food plots quite as regularly. They're not hitting scrape lines or rub lines quite as regularly. So what do you do? Well, you optimize your setups. Down below at the junction of this setup are scrapes. Three or four different scrapes and a scrape line leading to them. But this is a major hub of scraping. But just to be sure, in case these deer are chasing, uh, maybe not passing by the scrapes, just a little out of range, I've set a decoy also up to the side. That gives a visual aspect to this whole setup. So the deer might see the decoy, they might come into the scrapes, they might just pass by at this junction, and I might just get lucky. And that's what we're doing today in Kansas. like it hit just a little further to the front of him than I wanted. Problem now is that buck is literally fifty to sixty yards inside this jungle and he stopped. He's not going anywhere. That's a good sign. It's a bad sign that he didn't tip over right away. I backed out of there at dark. My decision was to leave him overnight. You push a buck in that Flint Hills country, you'll never see him again.
Now it was my turn to be depressed. Well, after watching Mark sweat it all night, we got in the morning and came up with a good plan. He went towards where he thought it might be. Oh man, he must have stood right here. Look at this boy. Look at that. That's some chunks too coming out of there. There's blood right here. Whoa, there. Dude, smashed it. Look at that. Look at this kicker. Yeah, great bass all the way up. Golly. I mean, these bucks in Kansas have just incredible mass on them. It's incredible whitetail country, but it's incredible country to lose a deer, too, if you just... If you just look around. Cliffs, deep timber, thick bush. So there we were. Greg and I, two bucks shot on the same day. It took me just a little longer to recover mine, but two super bucks. And guess what? It was a super moon. Now Greg's gonna remind me every time I see him that he shot the bigger buck, but next time I'm in Kansas, it might be my turn to shoot the super buck. Don't go away. Steve Bartillo shows you how to grow him big. This is Land of Whitetail. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Cuddyback Digital. More deer, fewer blanks. By Sig Sauer Electro Optics. Never settle by Thompson Center, America's master gunmaker. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Plus technology. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. When it comes to really making our food plot sing, you, know, you not only want a thriving food plot, you know, such as this Antler King Trophy Clover plot I'm standing in right now. You know, the, it, it's spring, and you know what? This stuff is green. They've been feeding on it all winter long. Okay, that's great. But let's take it up a couple notches. All right, for one thing, let's go ahead and plant a scrape tree out in front of our stand. We do that, and there's a decent chance that when Mr. Big comes out on the other side, it's going to suck him in. When it sucks him in, he goes ahead, he starts working it, you know what, he's positioning himself for the shot and he's paying, he's focusing his attention away from us rather than us being up in the stand and catching us coming to full draw. Okay, that's a nice little step. Go ahead and edge feather that plot. That's a nice little step as well. Leave the openings where you want the deer to come in and come out. Make it tough for them to exit and enter where you don't want them. That helps again. It just does nothing more than take it another step further. So, now, Let's go ahead and let's add a water source as well. We can do something as simple as just grabbing a bucket and burying it down to the lip, tamping the dirt in good, putting a couple inches of dirt in the bottom of the bucket, put a big stick in there so when those rodents get in, they can get out and not skank up our water. Now, I have the food plot itself drying deer. The edge feathering, not only is that helping us in screening and helping us where the deer are coming in and coming out exactly where we want them to more than they would otherwise. Not only is it helping in those regards, but it just went ahead and jacked that browse level up through the roof. So now all that fresh growth, all those tops are down in the ground, it's all deer food. It's all deer food and the deer are going to be drawn that much more. On those brassicas in the center then, go ahead and top seed them with a combo of fall, winter, spring, and lights out oats. Now we've got clover, we've got brassicas, we've got oats, we got cereal rye, and we've got all that extra browse. Clover's a big draw, don't get me wrong, but the more highly desirable offerings we can give, the better. So let's put a couple fruit trees out there too. Let's put out six fruit trees. If we're gonna go apple trees, let's make it so two are early dropping varieties, two are mid-season dropping varieties, and two are late season dropping varieties. Man, we just jacked it up again. Okay, now we got water, we got apples, we got tender brows, we've got clover, we've got brassicas, we've got cereal rye, we've got oats, and we've got those mock scrapes planted about 20 yards out in front of our stand. We've got the openings in the edge feathering coming out in safe wind directions within shooting range as much as possible. We've blockaded off those areas that are not safe winds for that stand to increase our odds and lower our impact. You start adding all that stuff together and now you're making a difference. 
it's good and great to put out a thriving plot. Okay, that's an awesome start. But now let's put that on steroids. Rather than do one planting, let's do a multiple of plantings. Then let's go ahead and edge feather. That edge feathering is kicking up browse levels through the roof as well. Then we add a water source. We add some apple trees. We slap in those scrape trees. Every single one of those is a little difference maker. The more little difference makers you can add together, the bigger of a deal it becomes. Growing Big with Steve Bartilla.